Okay. Yeah, this is Andre Bay. We will be hearing from him later. He's standing at his parents' apartment in, in Paris. Uh, he used the term working mathematician in an essay, Foundations of Mathematics for the Working Mathematician. He may have, he's certainly the first person to popularize it. Saunders McLean took up the phrase in his book titled Categories for the Working Mathematician. <clears throat> they both meant mathematicians who do care about logic or foundations or general methods, but only when these ideas help them find theorems and give proofs. They, they don't study these things for themselves. They study them when they're useful in giving proofs. <clears throat> Andre Vail, he was here, he was seen hiking. Uh, he was not, never in the military, but tells us when vast territories are being opened up, and Andre Vail did open up vast new territories for mathematics. When vast new territories, new ideas are being explored, nothing could be more harmful to the progress of mathematics than a literal observance of strict standards of rigor. You cannot be strictly rigorous all the time if you're doing important new mathematical, mathematical work. At the same time, it should always be remembered that it is the duty and it is the business of the mathematician to prove theorems and that this duty can never be disregarded for long without fatal effects. Mathematics requires non-rigorous work, breaking up new ideas, developing new inventions, but it only matters if it finally produces theorems. It will be ruined if you don't finally produce theorems. Saunders McLean put it more briefly, it's not mathematics until it's proved. It may be interesting, it may be fun, it may be creative, but it's not mathematics until there's a proof. What I'm gonna argue is that in fact, in historic fact, working mathematics in this sense, mathematics aimed at stating and proving theorems led to the important philosophies of mathematics. So I show you here some of the most important philosophers of mathematics, according to me, these are mathematicians. They are not normally considered philosophers of mathematics, but their work led to the important philosophies of mathematics, I will argue. I certainly do not mean that mathematicians only state and prove theorems. Of course not. Nobody thinks mathematicians only state and prove theorems. Certainly, Andre Vail did, he did a lot more than state and prove theorems. McLean did a lot more and state and prove theorems. They conceived new questions. They invented new methods. They saw new connections, which might you might want to prove a theorem, right? You see a connection between arithmetic and topology, that's great, but it only matters if you then prove theorems using it. Um, sometimes they invented new philosophies. They did a great deal more than state and prove theorems, but the, the final step for all of it, for these people, was proofs. It's not mathematics until it's a proof. Felix Klein, a very handsome man, and he was a he was a very he was a, he was very high up in German society. His family was high up in German society. These were the right people. He was uh, he was close friends with the Prussian Minister of Education, and if you want to be a professor. In Germany at that time, you should be, it, it would be really nice if you were close friends with the Minister of Education, and he was. <laughs> he was the greatest mathematical organizer ever. He did important mathematics himself, but he's more important for recognizing the leading trends of his time and the leading young mathematicians of his time. He, he did good work himself, but he also saw who was going to do the next good work. He got vast support from the government to recreate Göttingen University as a world center of mathematics. Carl Friedrich Gauss, the famous mathematician Gauss, had taught at Göttingen. Riemann had taught at Göttingen. And then the mathematics kind of fell off. After Riemann, nobody's as good as Gauss. I mean, come on, you can't do that. Um, and it sort of fell off a little bit. But then Felix Klein came and says to the Minister of Education, I can do that again at the same place. Not me personally, not that he would do the mathematics, he could bring the people. 
And he brought Hilbert in 1895, David Hilbert. And he brought Hermann Minkowski in 1902. You, you, might, you might have heard of Minkowski in connection with physics. He died young. Minkowski would be extremely famous had he lived longer. David Hilbert, of course, you can't be more famous than And that was Felix Fine who brought him. And Felix Fine went to America in 1893 to the Chicago World's Fair. This is a picture of the Chicago World's Fair. This is in Chicago doesn't look like that now, but it looked like that at the World's Fair. And he gave a talk for mathematicians near the World's Fair. Fine was very influential on American mathematics. American math de ma mathematics departments were very young at this time. They were just growing. I think possibly in 1893, no one had earned a doctoral degree in mathematics in America yet. Maybe one or, I think probably nobody. It just, it was too new. And they, they sought world level advice on what to do. They listened to Felix Klein. So Felix Klein did a great deal to establish the direction of American mathematics. He goes there, and he classified mathematicians into logicians, formalists, and intuitionists. Now, this became a very famous triple. Well, not quite. We don't say logicians. I mean, we say logicists. Logicism, formalism, and intuitionism became the famous philosophies of mathematics in the 20th century, and this is where the terms were introduced. This was the first time someone used these terms. But he did not mean at all what we mean today. Klein described these as working styles of specific leading mathematicians. These are ways different mathematicians actually work. He did not claim that one of them should work better than another. He just showed you the people using them. He showed you them working showed them working. And he said, every university needs at least one of each kind. Most German universities at this time had one or two mathematicians. And Felix Klein came up with a reason that they need three. He did this on purpose. He had, he had used other names before for the three kinds. And he went and he told his friend, every university needs three mathematicians, which was more than they had. <laughs> He says, the word, this is Klein's own word, he spoke in English. So this is great, you don't need to translate him because he was speaking in English. Now his friends helped him translate at the time. But the word logician here does not refer to mathematical logic. He knew mathematical logic, Hurst, Schroeder, people who were doing the first mathematical logic. But that's not who he's talking about. It means the main strength of these men is logical and critical power, the ability to give strict definitions and rigid deductions very precise definitions, precise proofs. We'll talk more about that. The formalist mathematicians, mathematicians, he said, excel in the skillful formal treatment of a given question in devising an algorithm. We'll have to say what that meant too. The intuitionists finally stressed geometrical intuition, not in pure geometry only, but in all branches of mathematics. Now by geometry, he means what we mean by geometry. We will still talk more about it. This is not at all what philosophers understood by logicists, formalists, intuitionists in 1930. It was going to completely change. We will see what he meant in 1893 and how they changed as they became, as they switched from working methods of mathematics to philosophies. Notably, Brouwer, this is Lautzen Jan Egbertus Brouwer. He was a big deal in Holland at his time. He really was. He was a wonderful mathematician. He would reverse the meanings of intuitionist and formalist in his debate with Hilbert. He would essentially reverse which, which they meant. We'll see that. For Klein, these were not rival positions. They had nothing to do with rivalry. Nobody argued between these ways of doing it. No. I mean, people might like their way better than another way, but one mathematician could belong to two groups. He, he's explicit. Klebsch, we don't hear much about Klebsch anymore, but he's very famous at the time. Klein tells us Klebsch may be said to belong both to the formalists and the intuitionists. He's both. While I should class myself as an intuitionist and also a logician. 
So these, these are not rivals. You don't have to pick one. You, you could pick two. Honestly, he believed David Hilbert was all three. Hilbert did everything. Klein believed he did everything. I believe he did everything. <laughs> The greatest of Klein's logicians was Karl Weierstrass, famed for his strict definitions and rigid deductions. He, he did not create the epsilon delta methods that we use now. You say a function is continuous at x if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that you know these definitions that, that we give now. He didn't create them, but he used them beautifully for more and much more advanced concepts. He took a lot of advanced concepts that had been obscure, put them in that form, and then when he gave a proof, it was a proof. It wasn't suggestions for how to think about it. It was a proof. You may have trouble believing how very poor the normal standards of rigor were at the time. Mathematics was, it was a wreck at the time. Uh, Many historians and philosophers only read the best mathematics books from the 19th century, and even the best are hard to read. But the average were terrible. You just, and they're not just that we can't read them, other people at the time couldn't read them. Very often, one great 19th century mathematician simply could not understand or accept another's proofs. Karl Weierstrass said, when Riemann announces a theorem, I assume it's true and I try to find a proof. Weierstrass knew that he could not read Riemann's proof and that he wouldn't like it if he read it. He said, I assume it's true. Riemann's a good guy. I'll bet it, if he says something's true, it's true. But then I go look for a proof because his proofs are terrible. I can't read them. And this was normal because Weierstrass was in Berlin and Riemann was in Göttingen. A mathematician at one university didn't expect to be able to read mathematicians at another university. I mean, this, this was really true. Mathematicians, mathematicians in Paris wouldn't try to read mathematicians in London. They, they might read them for the results, but not for the proofs. Because London, you couldn't, well, you couldn't understand what people were doing. David Hilbert in 1890. David Hilbert was a young man. David Hilbert was a very confident young man. Uh, David Hilbert had encouragement from well, from Felix Klein, I was going to say from all the top mathematicians at the time, he had it from Felix Klein. That's what that means. <laughs> he says, mathematicians, it seems to me, understand each other all too little today. And he's only talking about German mathematicians. He's, in fact, not very interested in French or English, let alone America. There's no mathematicians in America. <laughs> <He's talking. laughs> Mathematicians, it seems to me, understand each other all too little today. They have no lively interest in one another. And so far as I can judge, they know our classics too little. Not only do they not read each other, they don't even read the best. And this is surprisingly true. I mean, those guys can give lots more documentation. Professor Paul Gordon, who we will meet again, he was the teacher of Emmy Nether. Emmy Nether is a very famous woman mathematician. Well, this was her teacher. Her father, her father was a mathematician, but he didn't teach his own daughter. Paul Gordon. Emmy Netter and her father wrote the obituary for Paul Gordon, and they wrote this in it. This is for publication in the most prestigious mathematical journal of the time, the Mathematische Annale. For each work, Gordon compiled volumes of formulae, very well ordered, but providing a minimum of text. It was all formulas, no words. His mathematical friends undertook to prepare the text for press and correct the printer's proofs. So his, his mathematical friends would add words in between the, the equations. His friends were Max Nutter and Emmy Nutter. They're, the people writing this are the friends they're talking about. They could not always produce a fully correct conception. We wrote the proofs for him and we didn't always really know what he meant which is to say they never knew what he meant. And one often misses the deeper ground for the considerations. You cannot read the proofs in Paul Gordon's articles. Don't worry, he didn't write them anyway, and the people who wrote them didn't understand what he was talking about. You can read the formulas, you cannot read the proofs. And this remains true to this day. Nobody can read the proofs. Mathematics. 
mathematicians of the time agreed. Gordon gave persuasive results in unreadable papers. He, he would approach very complicated calculational questions and the results made sense. And mathematicians to this day feel that way. You do a long calculation, you may not be sure it's right, but if you figure if there's an important mistake, it'll turn into junk. It'll get it'll get disorganized, chaotic, unreadable towards the end. If the if the answers you keep getting keep making some kind of sense, then probably every step was at least close to right. And that was how people read Gordon. You couldn't tell what the steps were, but the answers were very symmetrical, very coherent. So people said, well, it's probably true. And he became a professor. At this time, there were only about eight professors of mathematics in Germany. Professor was a very rare title, and he was one of the eight. I mean, it was, so although we don't remember him much today, he, he had a very nice career based on proofs that no one could read and no one has read to this day. Uh, John Carlo Rota and Joseph Kuhn who tried to reconstruct his work in the 90s. And the notation, they said, we have explained his notation. You can see how to use his notation. You can see how to do his calculations. But as to his proofs, we were not able to do anything. And I think they're right. Because Gordon didn't like the proofs. And they don't, the people who wrote them didn't understand them. Henri Poincaré, the leading mathematician in 1900. Mathematician? He was the leading science writer in it. His popular science was selling all around the world. Um, it might be interesting to know how soon it was translated into Chinese. It got translated a lot. And he's the kind of thing that Republican Chinese scholars like to read. So um, he did beautiful mathematics, but his doctoral teacher, the, the man who supervised his dissertation, tells us to give a precise idea of how Poincaré worked. One must not fear to say that many of his points needed correction or explication. That is, many of the things he said were wrong, or at least impossible to understand. Poincaré was an intuitif. I left it in French as a pretty word, intuitif. He was intuitive. He, he, he relied on intuition. What does intuition mean? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. He was content to break through the difficulties and let others take care to find royal routes leading more easily to the goal. Now, again, the man is being polite. It's not just that others had to find easier ways. Others had to work out what the proof was because you couldn't tell from what it was, right? And there he is, Padre. It all accounts, he was a very nice man, a very polite man. He wasn't very interested in talking to most people, but he was really polite. Now, back to Klein at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. His category called logicians was the first to disappear. That, that category disappeared almost immediately because through the early 20th century, more and more mathematicians learned to give clear, rigorous proofs. The standards of rigor rose very fast. Um, they followed Weierstrass's example specifically. They read Weierstrass as a good example. Uh, Kronecker, Dedekind, Hilbert, more and more people. Also at this time, books were becoming cheaper and cheaper. Springer Verlag would publish books that students could buy. In the 19th century, you wouldn't have bought your textbooks. You would have gone to the, to the reading room where they had these huge expensive volumes and you would just use them in the reading room. But Springer started printing books that people could buy and take and just own them. And so Exposition got clearer. People started writing nicer books so that people would buy them. And just because there were more books, standards got more uniform. And the books all came, Springer's books all came out of Gibbigan. So now mathematicians in Berlin had to understand Gibbigan style if they wanted to read Springer books, which they did. And you would too. And some of those books are still worth reading. So they all start working like this. By around, say, 1910, it was normal. Not everybody was doing this, right? Mathemat mathematicians didn't just simply become rigorous. But by 1910, it was very normal. It was typical to work like what Klein called a logician. So there was no use for the name. It wasn't a kind of mathematician anymore. It was, it was normal. So the, the word logician 
switched over to just meaning people who worked in mathematical logic. Remember, Klein said, I don't mean mathematical logic. Well, once his use of the word was useless, it started just meaning mathematical logic. People, who, And then a slightly different name, logicist, arose to name a certain philosophy, which, which we'll get to. But they did change the name. And I should mention this word logicist, it comes from the German logicismus, and that ismus in German commonly means a mistake. Ismus doesn't just mean a thing people believe. It means a thing people mistakenly believe. They're too enthusiastic. It's a, it's a bit of a criticism. And yet it became the standard word. The evolution of formalism and intuitionism was, was, was more complex about that. Okay, as to formalists, recall what Klein said, the formalist mathematicians excel in the skillful formal treatment of a given question in devising an algorithm that today algorithm has a, it means precise step-by-step -step instructions for doing some calculation or solving some problem. And it basically means a computer program. Of course, you might not write it in a program, but it means something would turn into a computer program. But in, before about 1920, algorithm, oh, just algorithm should be in quotes, did not mean precise instructions. It meant a general approach to a subject. Like, for example, how do you find the maximum value of a function? Well, you take its derivative and you solve for where the derivative equals zero. This depends on it having a derivative. It doesn't always work, but it's, it's a framework. It's not the only way to find a maximum. You could find a maximum by looking at symmetry of the function or by thinking about what the function means. But our typical algorithm, what we teach in first year calculus, well, if it's a nice function, take its derivative, find where the derivative equals zero. That might be a maximum, might be a minimum. It might be an inflection point, but ju you just check where it's zero. So it's not precise instructions. It doesn't tell you how to find the derivative. It doesn't tell you how to solve for the derivative equals zero, but it tells you what framework to use. Here's Here's the way to approach the problem. That's what algorithm meant at that time. So they say it doesn't, this, these instructions don't, but they give a framework for, for finding the maximum. Leopold Kronecker. Kronecker, he was a good mathematician. He was, he was mean to Kronecker. He was just actually mean. He was a clever guy. Um, he liked philosophy. I think he might have been fun to meet, but he wasn't fun to argue with. Um, can you solve p of x equals zero for, for say, for this fourth degree polynomial? Um, and in general, any higher degree polynomial. The example I give is fourth degree. Now, the fundamental theorem of algebra immediately tells you there are four solutions if you count complex solutions and you count multiplicity. So everybody knows there's four roots, there's four solutions to this, maybe some are multiple. But for Kronecker, that says nothing. Kronecker says that tells me nothing at all. It doesn't estimate the solutions. It doesn't tell me, it, it doesn't even tell me if there are any real solutions or are they all complex? Kronecker says that's, he doesn't say the fundamental theorem is wrong. He says it, it's pointless. You don't learn anything from it. Kronecker gives precise instructions for estimating all the real roots. You, you give an error bound. You say, I want an error of, of 1%, and it will, it will find all the real roots within an error of 1%. Today, it's called the Sturm algorithm. It's, a, it, it's beautiful mathematics, and it, I should, it is used. It, Algebra, computer algebra packages like Mathematica use the Sturm algorithm the way Kronecker said to. But it, here's the problem with it. Any mathematician who could understand Kronecker's theorem could solve that one in their head. That one that actually was not hard for 19th century mathematicians. I don't know if anybody here saw that it's a fourth degree polynomial, but, but I could show you the tricks. I designed it. There's tricks that any 19th century mathematician would have known. Um, so they just said, oh, one, four, six, four, one. That's like the fourth power of a binomial. 
This is like a fourth power. It's not a fourth power, but you can change the constant term to make it a fourth power. Any mathematician would have seen that back in those days. Uh, and the cases you can't do in your head take a long time using Kronecker's result too. The Sturm algorithm is slow compared, uh, compared to what, what computer scientists want. It, it, in principle, it always works, but you can't always get away with using it. And th this has, has effects in elementary geometry. Colbert, well, between Colbert and Tarski, we have this theory called elementary Euclidean geometry. It's a decidable theory. You give any claim, you can tell whether it's true or false using the Sturm algorithm, except that in general, you can't tell because the algorithm won't get done working. Um, in, it's great that in principle you can tell, but Paul Gordon, who we saw, this was Klein's favorite example of a formalist. Max Netter, Emmy's father, well, Max and Emmy in that thing, they wrote, Gordon was an algorithmica. They used the word algorithm, which, like I say, wasn't quite, but they, they used it. He, he was an algorithmic. In Gordon's lifetime, again, this only meant a general framework for calculations. It didn't mean very precise instructions. Consider the discriminant of a quadratic polynomial. You got this quadratic polynomial, ax squared plus bx plus c. If you're going to study that polynomial, you're going to use the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac. You're going to use the discriminant for lots of things. Notably, you find the roots. Of course, if it's quadratic, you'll just immediately find the roots. And by today's standards, we say, well, that's all there is to know. You know the roots, you know. You know. Um, the solutions are that. So immediately, you see, if the discriminant was 0, the two roots would be the same. It would have a double root. It's a, It's... That, that's great for, for a quadratic. It's, an in, it's called an invariant, and it is the only invariant of a quadratic polynomial. Technically, it's a complete basis. Technically, every invariant is some constant multiple of a power of the discriminant. Or the, so the discriminant is the only, the only invariant. No, the others are all, are all just trivial calculations from it. Now, what about the discriminant of a fourth degree polynomial? Polynomials in one variable in all degrees, you, you might you might want to know about the discriminant of that. That will also tell you, for example, it will still have the property the discriminant is zero if and only if at least two of the roots coincide. So that's that's good to know. If two of the roots coincide, you can reduce this to a cubic polynomial, much easier to work with. Um, but the discriminant is too long to write here. It takes about a page to write in terms of A, B, C, and D. You can do it, but it's, it's long. But there are simpler invariants, I've written them out here, that form a complete basis, which means the discriminant can be written as a function of those two, and it's that function of those two. And this is way too complicated to keep in your mind. Don't worry about following this in detail. It is much too complicated for this. But Klein's formalists were the mathematicians who were good at organizing these kind of calculations into a very systematic form, so that even if you couldn't find the result, you could tell roughly what the result would be like. Gordon showed how to calculate a finite complete system of invariants for the degree n polynomial in one variable for every n. And people today, say that Gordon's proof gave away to find these systems. He showed us how to find the system, complete system invariants for every n. But Gordon said the opposite. Gordon said he could not find the systems for degree six or higher than six because it was too hard to do the procedure. He had a procedure that would work, but you couldn't do the procedure. <clears throat> and even today with computer algebra, they've been found for degree 14, but not higher. Even with a computer, in current methods, and, and it's gotten a lot of attention from computer. It's it has not been a it's not been a leading problem for computer scientists, but still we can't do it for degree four above fourteen. Gordon had no idea of what we call a constructive proof. He only knew what he could calculate and what he could not calculate, and he could calculate for degree six 
He could not finish the calculation for degree seven or eight. He talks about this when he went to a new job. Every, in Germany at that time, if you got a new teaching job, you would give a talk about your, your coming research. And he said, you know, I would like to be able to do this for degree seven and eight. Or at least I'd like to be able to do enough of it that I get an idea of what the results will be. But I can't do it in seven. Where Don was only interested in what he could actually calculate, what he couldn't actually calculate. But to do the actual calculations, he needs a system already. You can't do it for degree six by just guessing what will work. No, you, you need to work that just to get it to degree six. And Gordon never, ever said everyone should do math his way. He, he didn't think people had to do math his way. Now, later, this story comes up that he did. It's, it's, the story is not true. He, he never occurred to Gordon that everyone should do what he did. Remember, there's only about eight professors of math in Germany. He's very happy that other people can't do what he does. If other, they might have got his job. <laughs> he doesn't think everybody needs to do it this way. Sophus Lee was Klein's favorite intuition. Sophus Lee was a, uh, was a friend of Klein. Um, Sophus Lee was a Norwegian mathematician who created Lie groups and the Lie theory of differential equations. So his, his name is still known. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a nice story. It's a, it's a tough story. He had a, he had a hard time. Norway was a hard place to, to be from. He was intuitive. He did intuitive geometry of infinitesimals in four-dimensional space. Now, I think to a lot of us, infinitesimals don't sound intuitive, and four-dimensional space does not sound intuitive. It was intuitive to Lee. And, and, and he, again, he got these results. The great mathematicians of Berlin were, were decisive for this, Weierstrass, Kronecker, notably. They looked at Lee's results and they said, these are too coherent to be wrong. But that geometrical reasoning, that's, that's crazy. Nobody can make any sense of that. But the results must be right. So, so they would assign him a co-author. And, and Lee's book, Lee and Engel, Lee and I forget who the other guy is, they would assign him a co-author who would provide analytic proofs for all the theorems. And they said, okay, this is more precise, except that the analytic proofs didn't make sense either and didn't prove the theorems. It was it, 19th century. It was not like what, what we expect from mathematics today. He, he was largely right. He was largely right. But, but it was a horror to Weierstrass, Kronecker, later Brouwer. I mean, it was just this, you know, I want you to picture two infinitesimal translations at right angles in four-dimensional space. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not picturing that. Henri Poincaré was an intuitionist in Klein's sense. He geometrized everything. Yes, uh, made, made beautiful progress in number theory by showing that a lot of problems of number theory, not, not all, no, nothing works for all of number theory, but a lot of problems. You could start with a curve given by a cubic equation. Oops. So this is given by a cubic equation. And if you knew, say, this might be the solution, zero, zero, maybe this is a number theory problem. And if you set all the variables equal to zero, it's a solution, just a, not a useful solution. And if you could find one other solution, then you could consider this straight line that went through those two solutions. And this would be another solution because it's a cubic equation. It sets up a cubic equation on this line. But since you know one of the roots of that cubic, it because that reduces to a quadratic and you can solve the quadratic and you will find another solution. And this is the basic technique that became Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem. A very much more advanced version of this kind of thinking. Um, Wiles, what Wiles actually proved was that every elliptic curve is modular. And elliptic basically means degree three. There's technicalities there. But basically, Wiles showed all of these cubic curves that Poincaré used have this problem called modularity. 
very technical, but very important concept. Barry Mazur wrote an excellent paper trying to make it popular, but quite. Poincaré, so he, he takes number theory and turns it into this kind of geometry. The simple fact that if you have a degree three curve and you know two points on it, the line between them meets it in a third point. Well, of course it might not. Um, it, the line might be tangent to that point. Oops. In which case that will be a double solution. If you have a, a tangent, it will be a, a double solution. So Poincaré, he, he turns lots of problems into geometry. Some of them are problems in differential equations like the motion of planets in the solar system. Can we be sure that the Earth is not going to launch out of its orbit and disappear into space? Well, in fact, we can be sure that there are initial conditions that would do that. It is possible for the other planets to pull the Earth, the Earth out of its orbit and send it off into interplanetary space. Um, the wandering Earth is not about that. Wandering Earth is a satellite. But, it's, um, but can we be sure that the present universe isn't going to do that? So this is a, a kind of a geometric problem already, and Poincaré approaches it geometrically. But even this number theory also, Poincaré makes everything he does geometrical. And for, for, for Klein, this was what intuitionist meant, making things geometrical. Poincaré certainly does that. The working methods began to merge. Naturally, these are things that people are actually doing. And when you have something people are actually doing, it's going to develop. It's not going to stay what it was because it's succeeding. And so people are going to keep changing it. One small puzzling proof by David Hobart in 1888 became a model of 20th century axiomatic mathematics. It's a really small proof and it became extremely important in people's way of thinking. Miles Reed, undergraduate commutative algebra. Miles Reed writes nice textbooks. Nice textbooks. Hilbert's abstract methods of proving the existence of finite sets of generators without explicitly constructing them were denounced at the time as theology, not mathematics. He's talking about Paul Gordon. This proof, it did become central to the modern axiomatic method. Um, the legend, this legend is extremely important in philosophy of mathematics. I'll tell you, Eric Temple Bell wrote this, this book, Development of Mathematics. He's more famous for men of mathematics. A lot of mathematicians say they first got interested in math because of men of mathematics. Men of mathematics is, uh, it's, it's, it's partly imagined. It's a very fanciful book. Development of Mathematics is a, a much more straightforward book. He tells us, only main trends of the past 6,000 years are considered here. We have only time for the main trends. And they're represented only through typical major episodes in each. We can only hit the very most important. It's a 450-page book on 6,000 years of math. So it's, you know, got to be very... He used that quote about theology three times, three times in this book. Having said, we're only going to do major things, he uses it three different places in the second edition. Paul Gordon and David Hilbert. David Hilbert proved a theorem that replaced Gordon's theorem. I'll, I'll talk more about how that happened. Gordon and Hilbert both knew the way you solve a mathematical problem is you often systematically, artfully discard Vast amounts of information do not help. You've got a problem. You know a lot about it. Most of what you know about it is not going to solve that problem. And you have to find a way to just the part that will solve that problem. So you need to be able to throw out the, the useless part, so to speak, so you can see what you're doing. Uh, Hilbert was better at finding ways. Gordon had systematized the calculation of invariance of, of one variable polynomials so that he could show that in every degree, there's a finite basis, a finite complete basis. Hilbert gives a much quicker proof for one degree polynomials, or for one variable polynomials, and it works for any finite number of variables. Hilbert can show 
take two variables, polynomials and two variables, take polynomials and seven variables in any degree you like, let it be degree 32, but you do not want to see a 32 degree equation in seven variables, but doesn't matter for his proof, any, no, any degree, any number of variables, he can show that that polynomial has a finite basis of invariance. Now it's clear that you can't really use Hilbert's theorem directly to find the invariance. In principle, you could use Gordon's theorem directly, except that you couldn't really get, and it was only for one variable. Um, Hilbert found a, a, a very quick proof. Gordon had spent his, early in his life, he proved the case of one variable. He spent the rest of his career trying to make it work in higher degree and prove it for more variables, for any finite number of variables. And then, and then Hilbert gives a one and a half page proof that it works for any number of variables, but in a way that you really can't, you can't find the, you know you can't find the proof of Hilbert's proof. Um, and then, so supposedly Gordon said, looked at Hilbert's proof and said, this is not mathematics, it's theology. People love to repeat this. This is not mathematics, it's theology. Gordon was a funny guy. Gordon liked joking. Gordon admired Hilbert's theorem very much. He did not revile it at the time. He loved Hilbert's theorem. He, Gordon, um, he never suggested, I, I, I mean, I, I covered those things. Gordon, well, I should, I, let's see, where did I get this? Yeah, they began by collaborating. Hilbert writes to Klein, I was with Professor Gordon and I had this infinite series of brain waves and we believe I found a masterful short and to the, proof, to the point proof of the finite, uh, first of the finiteness of complete systems for polynomials in, in two variables, but then quickly in any number of variables. He discovers this with Gordon in Erlang. Probably they're drinking beer. Gordon loved to talk about mathematics over beer in a, in a bar. There. Gordon had been famous for 20 years for proving the two variable case. And, and now all of a sudden Hilbert announced it and Hilbert very soon after this does it for all variables, uh, any number of variables. It was called Gordon's problem. Hilbert solved it in a page and a half. This had to be hard for Gordon. Right? He says, here's this sharp young man, bright guy, I like him. He's given me a very nice argument. This problem I've been working on for 20 years, he solves it in a page and a half. He, he, it would, you could forgive him if he just refused to believe it, but he didn't. He said immediately, this is wonderful. He didn't denounce it. Hilbert ignores all, nearly everything about the problem he shows a, a much more abstract thing that I don't, I don't think I need to, to go into that now, but let me go back to the slides I skipped. Um, Gordon did not, again, I wanna emphasize, Gordon had no idea of constructive mathematics. He saw two possibilities. One, you can actually find X. You can do actual calculations. You can discover what X is. Two, you can prove X exists, but you cannot actually find it. Those are the two possibilities he knew. He was not interested in the middle option where you have a method to find X in principle, you just can't really do it. That didn't mean anything to Gordon. He was not interested in saying, in principle, I could do this, I just can't really do it. He could say, I can do it, say, I can't do it. He would not say, in principle, I could do it. He had no such idea. Now, the principle notion of constructive proof is important. It is theoretically very important. But philosophers sometimes go wrong. They think if you have a constructive proof, it shows you how to find the answer. But maybe only in principle, you may not be able to use it to find the answer. And that is important. That principled level is important, but it's not the same as actually being able to find the answer. And what Gordon knew that too many philosophers today don't know, no matter how simple a way you have of taking a degree n polynomial and finding a basis, there are going to be some numbers n so large that you can't do that. This will happen. There are numbers so large you can't write them down, let alone apply them to some theorem. We forget constructive does not mean you could actually do it. And not only doesn't it mean the same thing, 
any constructive solution will become infeasible for some inputs. It's, it's built into the infinity of the natural numbers. Constructive, constructive solutions, any computer program will become impossible to run for large enough inputs, right? You could write an input so long that it takes the life of the earth just for the computer to read it in. So it's not gonna get any calculations done. The fact that we can do it on a computer does not in any way mean we can actually do it. These are, and of course, computer scientists absolutely know this. Well, this is, this is how public key cryptography works, right? You, the reason you can do your banking on a computer is because the computer, the bank at the computer solves a problem that any stranger could solve in enough time, but they can't actually get it done. The bank can do it because they have one more step of information. So Gordon has so so Gordon looks at Hilbert's proof. Gordon looks at Hilbert's proof, and he, first of all, he says it's great. He writes to Klein and says, this is a terrific proof. Hilbert publishes a, an elaborate, incorrect proof. This proof, was, it's a short proof, and yet it's so tricky. It was so new. The way of working was so unheard of that Hilbert himself gets it wrong in his first publication. The editors have to correct it in a footnote. They say, okay, you know, here we, and, and they probably correct it wrong. Um, after he corrected this mistake, he still knew it was hard to follow. Simple reason, so short, so surprising, so unprecedented at the time. Three pages by Hilbert outdid Gordon's 20 year career. And Klein writes to, oh, so, we, so Hilbert writes it up. Let's see, did I put this in the slide? No, maybe not. Hilbert writes it up and sends it to the Mathematische Annale, the leading math journal of the time. Uh, he, he knows he, he knows it's going to be okay. And they send it to Gordon to referee. And Gordon says, this is wonderful. It's correct. It's important. But I can't follow the proof. The, the proof is, is not good. And we now know the proof was, was, was wrong. Um, and Hilbert was furious. No criticism. Publish it. Just publish it. <laughs> and Klein does just publish it. Um, but, but Gordon says, this, this will help with the actual problem, but it, but it needs more work. Now, Hilbert's, Hilbert's abstract theorem can't be proved constructively. It doesn't come with enough data. It's for arbitrary sets of polynomials. You can't prove anything constructively about an arbitrary set of polynomials because you haven't given data on how the set was defined. There's nothing to begin constructing with, right? So, you, of course, that's not constructive. Gordon's problem doesn't really need arbitrary sets. There is a way to specify the sets for Gordon's problem, and then with that way, you can. And Gordon always knew that Hilbert's theorem could be made calculational, always knew. And Hilbert later did that. He later filled it out to make it constructive um, using his Nullstellensatz, very one of his famous theorems, lots of his other famous theorems. Hilbert goes ahead and, and meets all of Gordon's objections. Yeah, Gordon writes, the claims are indeed quite important and correct, but the proof does not measure up to the most modest demand one makes of a mathematical proof. It is not enough that the author make the matter clear to himself. One demands that he build a proof following secure rules. Gilbert disdains to lay out his proof by formal rules. He thinks it's enough if no one can contradict his proof and then all is in order. It may be so for the initial discovery, but not for a detailed article in the analogy. Gordon doesn't, he doesn't contradict Hilbert's proof at all. He thinks Hilbert's conclusion is correct. He thinks you can't contradict the conclusion. But he says the proof doesn't say anything to me. And Gordon then goes on to develop calculating tools using Hilbert's ideas. I will say explicitly that this would not have occurred to me if Hilbert had not found the advantages for invariant theory of certain concepts developed by Dedekind, Kronecker, and Weber in other parts of algebra. Gordon says this abstract algebra, this scary three-page proof of something I couldn't find in 20 years, it doesn't really help you. At first, it doesn't help you directly to find the, actually find an answer. 
it will help you find the answer once you develop it well. And I would never have found those better means without the abstract algebra. That abstract algebra led me to better ways of actually calculating. And to Gordon, that was normal. He was happy to believe Hilbert has given an abstract proof. I can't see what it means, but I'll bet it will help me find better calculations when I apply it to a calculational situation. He's not against it at all. He, he admired it. Um, 20 years later, this story comes up. It didn't come up while Gordon was alive. 20 years later, after he died, Max Netter, Emmy Netter's father, says that, that Gordon called the proof not mathematics, but theology. And this story gets told and told and told as if Gordon hated the proof and was trying to say it's not math. One loves that proof. But he also thought we need to develop it further in ways that Hilbert went on to do, but only after he got the first paper in the Annala, right? Publish that first paper first. Then I will publish improvements later. Uh, I, I could say more, but Hilbert, well, I, it, it's, this is all true, but it's not, it's, it, it's maybe not very enlightening. Hilbert says, Paul Gordon had a certain unclear feeling of transfinite methods in my invariant proof which he expressed by calling the proof theological. He changed the presentation of my proof by bringing in his symbolic method and thought he thereby stripped off its theological character. In truth, the transfinite reasoning was only hidden behind the formalism. A modern mathematician looks at that and says, that could all be true. That could, that could be, it's not true. It's absolutely not true. Gordon never said anything about transfinite. Um, Gordon did not use his symbolic method to clarify Hilbert. It's, it's, it's untrue about Gordon, but it looks it, to our modern mind, it makes sense. Oh, he was old fashioned. He didn't understand these modern things. It's actually just not what happened. Gordon never spoke for finitism, although he himself used finite methods. Okay, if you have to actually get the calculation done, then it will be explicitly finite, right? There's only going to be a finite number of sheets of paper, only a finite number of marks on each sheet. But Gordon never said, never defended. So there was a, a large and unhappy series of interpretations of what Gordon meant. People fought about this for decades, this Gordon quote. He was just a funny guy. He liked beer, he liked cigars, he made jokes. He was... The conflict was made up. Gordon never had a, a problem. He did say, I don't understand the proof. And the first time he said that, the proof was in fact wrong. Hilbert had submitted an incorrect proof. But the mathematics was genuinely important. Hilbert's insight, this was a radical new insight into how to use axiomatic algebra to radically simplify calculational mathematics, not to replace calculations, but to simplify them for logic and structural. And I want to point out three different roles that axioms had in Hilbert's work. One role to focus on just key aspects of a problem, forget a lot of irrelevant aspects. The way Hilbert proves the finiteness of these bases, he says, forget what an invariant is, forget what we meant by basis, just consider any set of polynomials that's closed to under addition. That's all that's gonna matter here. And then he doesn't quite get the finiteness of the basis, but he gets the, finite, the finiteness of something like a basis which then when you remember what a basis is, boom, then you add a little bit and you get the original classical theorem. The abstract reasoning doesn't give the classical theorem exactly, but it does all the hard work very quickly and then you easily get the classical. He uses the axiomatics to produce rigorously formalized treatment of a subject. He says, if we wanna know what do we mean by arithmetic? Arithmetic, I mean, we know all kinds of stuff about arithmetic. Is our theory of arithmetic consistent? Ooh, we better be precise about what we mean. It's a question, okay, is ordinary arithmetic consistent? Is the arithmetic that the people selling food on the street use, is that consistent? Well, yeah, they've been using it for thousands of years. It's consistent, all not an interesting question. Is Peano arithmetic consistent? Ah, oh, there's a question, there's a question. And for this, we need formalized treatments if we wanna have serious mathematical questions. To generalize from one particular subject to another, that happened a lot. It didn't happen 
Well, Hilbert's invariant theorem, he, he used it to apply, to prove Gordon, to solve Gordon's problem for invariance. He quickly saw it solved lots of other problems. And he radically underestimated how many it solved. When he published a, a three-part series in Ignala, he gives lots of applications. It's nothing to the applications we have in textbook mathematics today. Um, But there's a fourth role that's also important in today's mathematics, which was found in Gordon's work and Emmy Netter's and many more after that, notably including Alexander Grotenbeek. I like Alexander Grotenbeek. That's absolutely a lot to say about him. But Hilbert doesn't use this to describe abstract structures with no previously familiar concrete examples. Every time Hilbert gives abstract axioms, he can tell you the familiar examples that they apply to. They're just a way of stripping down to the relevant information, getting rid of unnecessary complications and familiar examples. But once people start using this method, Netter herself already, and Alexander Grotendieck much more, we start finding unfamiliar examples of that same, of that same axiomatic structure. But Hilbert doesn't do that. Leo Corey talks about this. Still just take my word for it. Leo Corey wrote a whole big history book. Hilbert. Hilbert's axioms always have classical examples, and he can tell you what they are, and that's why he's doing them. Later, people come up with these kinds of axioms to invent completely new, unheard of, but useful structures. Yes, Leo Carr. Hilbert's own use of the axiomatic method involved, by definition, an acknowledgment of the conceptual priority of the concrete entities of classical mathematics and a desire to improve our understanding of them rather than a drive to encourage the study of mathematical entities defined by abstract axioms devoid of immediate intuitive significance. Gordon said that his symbolic method had no intuitive meaning. He could not interpret it. It would give you correct answers, but you take the steps in between, you can't interpret that intermediate stuff. It's all meaningless symbols. But the answer will be right at the end. Um, and of course, for in the hands of Grotendieck, he gives axioms and the examples he applies, they have no immediate intuitive significance. But when you think about them, you see, oh, you do find an intuitive, but it was only invented through the axiomatic method. Michael related everything he worked on to everything else he worked on. He was an intu he was an intuitionist in fine sense. He geometrizes everything, but he relates everything to everything. What I'm talking about here now is how these working methods change as they're used. Since Poincaré relates everything he works on to everything else he works on, he creates topology having grown from differential equations by using group theory and Contra's new set theory. He brings all of these together. And this is part of why everyone became a logician, because you can't bring these together if you don't use rigid de definitions and rigid proofs. If you just try to sort of guess at combining these things, you will produce a mess. So Poincaré doesn't just try to guess. He, Poincaré, Poincaré, well, Poincaré, he does kind of guess, but he, the students, the people who apply him, they, they develop it much more carefully. They all fed into his view of intuition. His popular science writing, it really was a, a deep expression of his faith in science. Poincaré belonged to a generation in France, the generation of the Second French Republic, who threw over this, who overthrew the Second French Empire. This, the, the Republicans of his family they all, they were all pro-science. They were against, they were against superstition. They, they were in favor of say public health. We can cure diseases. We should go cure diseases. We can make cities cleaner. Let's go make the cities cleaner. His, 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 whole, his whole social set was about this kind of progress. And he expresses that in his popular science writing. Right, so point right, it's all one thing, it's all you know, I will say philosophers often tell you that Poincaré's papers on foundations are disconnected from his positive work in mathematics, that's a quote of Warren Goldfarb, or his philosophic comments on mathematics are almost exclusively concerned with basic number theory, set theory, and logic, that's Janet Polina, these are complete mistakes. 
Um, they come from not having read. Well, first of all, they come from reading Poincaré's popular essays in, in books. His essays were collected into books, but when they collected them, they shortened them. And they left out the most mathematical passages because they thought customers won't want mathematics. They left out the sharpest arguments because they said, well, that's a little bit mean. Customers don't want to read that. If you go back to Poincaré's original articles in journals, he connects his philosophy to his mathematics a lot. And if you read his actual mathematics, he connects it to his philosophy sometimes. Not a lot, right? When he's writing about differential equations, not a lot of philosophy in that. But there's some if you actually read what he said. So this is, this is just, these are just mistakes. Poincaré was not like that. So again, Poincaré, he never becomes, he never enters the period of modern rigor, but he likes modern rigor and his work is helping produce, drive other people into that modern, that modern approach. He never imagined giving up a single theorem of classical 19th century analysis. People say Poincaré was an intuitionist and intuitionists reject excluded middle and intuitionists reject infinitary reasoning. No, Poincaré never rejected anything any mathematician had done. He just didn't. He simply never imagined what we actually know today that some classical theorems were intrinsically impredicate. They were logically complex. He underestimated the logical complexity of 19th century mathematics, but he never rejected 19th century. He thought predicativity was an interesting theoretical question for formal logic. He insisted logic puzzles would never affect mathematics. And in this, he's partly wrong. Logic puzzles have become mathematically important. But what he's not is an intuitionist who says, forget that logic stuff, that's all junk. No, he believes the logic will never raise any, it will only solve problems, it will never raise problems. How to tell a sphere from a torus and why? Topology grows out of Riemann's work on calculus, specifically in complex analysis. Poincaré looks at the, all, all these shapes and he knows why if you're doing complex analysis, it matters very much how many holes a surface has. Does it have one hole or two holes or three holes or is it a sphere with no holes? In it? Um, and, and so he says, how are we gonna really describe this? The number of handles is called the genus. In, in, in visual terms, Two surfaces can be stretched and bent fit each other only if they have the same number of handles. You can't, you can't mix the number of handles and get them to map onto each other. But how do we make this into mathematics? How do we find things? It's, it's one thing to draw pictures, but how do we make this mathematics? And well, yeah, there's a picture I drew. Michael Ray comes up with methods of doing this. And he tells us topology in three dimensions is virtually in three dimensions is virtually intuitive knowledge for us. In more than three dimensions, it presents enormous difficulties. To try surmounting these, one must be convinced of the extreme importance of the subject, the various routes which I have successively followed in differential equations, dynamics, and Lie groups that led me to topology, take the three body problem. Will will some of the planets wander off into the heavens or, or not? He's going to answer this using topology. It's a problem in nine-dimensional space. He's going to need to work in nine-dimensional space. And exact solutions are impossible. For one thing, you don't even know the exact equations of planetary motion because there's, there's all these little asteroids. They're making a difference. You're not going to account for those. We don't want exact solutions in astronomy. We want topological solutions. We want qualitative solutions. And Planetary makes topology a central tool for answering questions like this. This says this is a I guess so. I didn't really describe his, his topology, but like I said, he never connects those pictures to modern rigor, but he makes other people do it. He, he, he sets up the conditions where they ha you have, you need a logician's rigor and, and, and a formalist's algorithms 
to learn to use that geometric picture. These things are coming together. Um, philosophers often think Mike Ray was a disapproving of the new methods when he wrote this. Heretofore, when a new function was invented, it was for some practical end. Today, they are invented expressly to put a fault to the reasoning of our fathers, and one will never get more from them than that. People used to think if you had a continuous function, it must be differentiable everywhere. So you have a continuous function. Okay, the absolute value function, that's continuous. It's not differentiable at zero, but it's differentiable everywhere except zero. Karl Weierstrass comes up with a function. It's continuous, and it has no derivative anywhere. And people were shocked at this. They said, that's that's a crazy function. And Mike Ray says, yeah, we, it was invented expressly to put a fault in reason of our fathers, and no one will get any more from it than that. But, he says, that's also important to do because our fathers were wrong about this. This is not a criticism of the new function. This is a praise of the new function. Our fathers were mistaken about this question, and Father Strauss has showed it. He, he thinks this is a good thing. He, said, he says, but criticism of faulty reasoning is valuable itself. And so now these, these methods are beginning to come together. Poincaré remains a complete intuitionist, but Poincaré believes in logic, and Poincaré believes in formal calculation. He just doesn't do those things himself. If Poincaré says, if we read a book written 50 years ago, the greater part of the reasoning what we find will strike us as devoid of rigor, this is seriously true. People don't read those books. They're hard to read, and they are they're bad reasoning. One admitted many claims which were sometimes false, including Pankaray's own papers have many claims which are sometimes false. So we see we have advanced towards rigor, and I would add that we have attained it, and our reasonings will not appear ridiculous to our descendants. He believed that the new modern standards of rigor were a very good thing, even though he never used them himself. Michael Ray is famous for having argued with Russell about logic. I don't know if you know about the russell Michael Ray debates on logic, but these in American philosophy, Michael Ray is known primarily as an opponent of Bertrand Russell on logic, and Russell's a good guy, so Michael Ray must be a bad guy, right? Because if you argue against a good guy, you're a bad guy. But Russell should have known Michael Ray was doing him a favor. Poincaré was the greatest mathematician in the world at that time. He was the world's leading. Russell was a promising young philosopher at Cambridge. Poincaré was promoting Russell. Poincaré was helping make Russell famous. He did disagree with Russell about some of it. He others he thought Russell just needed to do a better job, but he absolutely wanted people reading Russell's arguments. So, I mean... Any fields medalist who wants to write about me, I get to go ahead and write about me. You know? um, and this is, he's not just a fields medal. He, he's already Poincaré. He's not just the world's leading mathematician. He's the world's leading popular science author. He is the most famous scientist in the world. And he's arguing with Bertrand Russell. Russell should have been very grateful. And he was relating those philosophic ideas to actual mathematics. He absolutely was relating philosophy, his philosophy and other people's, to actual mathematics. It's, it's crazy the way philosophers today say they didn't know that. Absolutely did. Our fathers thought they knew what a fraction was, or continuity, or the area of a curved surface. We have found they did not know it. He's joking a little bit about fraction. He's not joking at all about continuity or area of curved surfaces. He himself made important new contributions to rigorous understanding of continuity and the area of curved surfaces. The length of a curved line is fairly easy to, to define, but the area of a curved surface, much more subtle problem. Poincaré was aware of that because he had contributed to solving that problem. These are genuine problems. We have genuinely improved on what our fathers knew. And he has surprised, we'll come back to this tomorrow. He has surprisingly fine appreciation for Hilbert's goals and foundations of geometry. He says one could confine Hilbert's axioms and the foundations of geometry to a reasoning machine, 
such as the logical piano of Jevons, and wanted to see all of geometry come out. Hilbert didn't think this yet. Hilbert had not compared his foundations to machines at all. Poincaré invented that connection. Hilbert, two years later, starts writing about it this way because he read Poincaré. Um, Poincaré says, yeah, Hilbert has given us such good axioms that you could put them into a machine and the theorems would come out. Now we will talk, um, and we, we will be talking about so, uh, after the talks too a lot about how to make you know how far this is from reality, but uh, but it's a, it's an important truth. Huh? Today we know Hilbert fell far short of formal rigor, and uh, and well we know that Jevons' piano is inadequate. Jevons knew that too. Jevons built a little. It's as if he built a tiny little test computer to show that computers could exist. He didn't think the one he built would work for anything important. It wasn't meant to. It was just meant to basically work and show you, yeah, you can actually make these things. Poincaré endorsed this concept of formal logic as the only way to tell what really does or doesn't follow from given axioms. Because it's very hard when you're doing geometry to not slip in some, some intuitive ideas that you didn't really state. But a machine will not slip in any intuitive because it doesn't have any. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Andre liked mathematics. One day, speaking in front of Henri Poincaré about a mathematician who quit his studies in favor of the cast, I want you to imagine a group of Parisian gentlemen in 1890, they're well-to-do. They're standing in a lovely garden. China, you know about lovely gardens. They're but the parents does too. And someone says, you know, yes, he left mathematics, but everything has its worth after all. No doubt he'll be just as happy as if he kept doing mathematics. My uncle made a gesture of protest to cut short the conversation. You're in a lovely garden. A friend of yours has stopped studying mathematics, and you say to Poincaré, well, he'll do other things. They're nice, too. Poincaré says, <laughs> don't talk to him about anything except math. <laughs> if you can do math. Now, a lot of people can't do math, but if you can do math, Poincaré thinks you should. That's the thing. And he was genuinely interested in logic. We talked about that. Did Poincaré, did Poincaré argue about foundations of mathematics? Absolutely not. It, we will t they'll tell you that Poincaré argued about the new math. He did. In 1912, at the height of his activity on foundations, he died in 1912. This is, he, he's only 54. He's not going to go any farther because he's not going to be alive. He talks to the French Society of Moral Education. Have you ever talked to a society for moral education? Anyway, he's talking to a society for moral education. And he tells them that unlike debates over morality, mathematicians will never debate how to prove a theorem. Was he lying to the moral educators? No, he was not lying. Poincaré didn't debate whether the new math was any good. Poincaré never debated any kind of math. He didn't go and lie. He says they'll never debate it. Poincaré was not. The, this, we get this idea that he, he rejected the new mathematics. He did not reject any mathematics. If you think he did reject some of the new math, then you have to, have to think he went and lied to the moral educators. What a terrible thing to do. And he didn't do that. No, he meant this. Poincaré means everything, he says. He's much more or should we believe he didn't reject the new math? Well, of course we should. Okay, now, those methods grew and interacted. I mean, we've seen them beginning to grow and interact. And as they get more successful, they interact more. Normal ideas that are actually used will interact. They will change. Any idea that actually gets used will change when it's being used. Is that true for any idea? I'm going to say it for any. Hal Brown. Hal Brown was a young math student in the 1930s. 
And she gives us a wonderful description of what was going on in math education in the 1930s. She says, this largely goes back to the algebraist. That's a reference to Emmy Nutt, as a matter. University mathematics became, so to say, more logical. One learns methods, and everything is put into a theory. Professors give lectures so that a sound understanding suffices for the student to follow, and special giftedness is no longer so extremely important. To succeed in a math as a mathematician in the 19th century, you had to be especially gifted, because your professor's descriptions would be wrong, and you had to get the right parts and separate them from the wrong parts, Incidentally, yours could also be partly wrong, but if they were just junk, you would not succeed. You know, um, in my student days, university mathematics rested strongly on being mathematical gifted. Logic and notation were not so well established. Proofs were not rigorous. Published definitions were not rigorous. Um, the days are gone now. Happily, the days are gone when one fondly described one's professor with, he said A, wrote B, meant C, and D is correct. Now, nowadays, when your math professor says something, it's probably what he's writing, he or she is writing, what he or she means, and it's probably correct. Didn't used to be the case. Didn't used to be the case. But it was becoming the case, largely because of the algebraists. What do we mean by algebraists? We mean Emmy Nutter and her students. By 1915, I mean, Nutter became a leader in unifying these working styles of mathematics. Hilbert was important. Poincaré was important in driving the unification, though he never did it. Hilbert was important in beginning the unification, although he stayed largely 19th century in his attitudes. I mean, it's just way better than almost any other mathematician, but he is still sort of typically 19th century. I and mean, Nutter is not. As Klein's distinction of working styles lost practical relevance, it hardened into those three schools of philosophy. We'll talk more about that. New working methods arose in geometry and number theory. We'll be talking about that. Um, Nathan Jacobson tells us Emmy Nutter's proofs were and remain startling in their simplicity. Emmy Nutter. Her, tip of her best proofs, her proofs in the best period of her mathematics, they're short, they're simple, they're over before you know it. And for the original people who read them, it was like, she hasn't said enough yet. This can't be right. The right answer has to be longer than this. No, of course, the right answer isn't longer than this. Um, he, uh, he was her replacement teaching math at Bryn Mawr. I mean, Nutter was in Germany in 1933. She was 51 years old, and she was driven out of Germany because she was Jewish and a leftist. And people tried to get her, her work in Russia. She was she she liked Russia. She had visited Russia several times and liked it, but they didn't go through. Uh, they finally got her a job at a women's college outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the United States. The dean of that college had studied mathematics with Hilbert. Um, the The women at that college were just thrilled that Emmy Nutter was, was coming in. The dean says, Emmy could have come to us full of the bitterness of an exile. She had been driven from her home. Her brother had gone into the Soviet Union. She was in the US. They're now living on opposite sides of the world. They were very close. Um, she could have come to us bitter at what had happened to her. But no, she came completely interested in our American ways. There was a reception to welcome her, and there was tea at the reception. And what would happen is the second most important person at the reception would pour the tea, right? Because that's fun to pour the, to pour the tea for people. But Emmy insisted, no, no, she would pour the tea. She was the most important person, but she wanted to pour the tea because she didn't understand this American have a way of, of exact, it's not the same as Chinese tea, you know, it's treated differently. Um, she wanted to see how this American thing was handled. So they, they loved her in, in, in Denmark, um, and he was her replacement when she, when she died. She died at age 54. But I also thought, 
what people will tell you about Emmy Neffer when she did her dissertation with Paul Gordon, with that guy whose proofs you couldn't read because probably she had written them and she didn't understand what he was talking about. And she used his symbolic method that to this day, nobody can explain. You cannot read her dissertation. Um, several mathematicians have tried to read her dissertation. You just can't do it. You, you can read it and tell what it's about, but you can't recover the mathematics. She gives all these long tables of results. You can't recover those results. Um, so people say, well, she did her dissertation with Paul Gordon and then abandoned his methods in favor of Hilbert. The reason they say this is that Hermann Weyl says this. Hermann Weyl is a great mathematician. He was a true friend to Emmy Nutter. He was a true friend to David Hilbert, but he did not like Nutter's way of doing math. And he tells us he didn't. Didn't like. He liked her a lot, and he saw that she was right, and he saw that she was important, but he felt it wasn't the right way. He just couldn't never feel it was the right way. Um, and so he tells us that she abandoned Gordon's method, but she tells us that she never abandoned Gordon's method at all. She simply combined it with Hilbert. It's not, she didn't move from one to the other. She combined them. And that she really only cared for abstract algebra. People love to say this. She only, that's completely false. In fact, after doing her dissertation with Gordon, she combined his ideas with that of things in Hilbert to greatly simplify and strengthen her earlier theorem by Hilbert. She used ideas from Sophus Lee, plus her own formal calculus to prove a major theorem in mathematical physics. It's a settled question of general relativity. She did not only do algebra, she did create the now standard abstract algebra of rings, modules, and algebras. Um, she supervised a dissertation that is today considered the foundational paper for computer algebra. She supervised a dissertation where this woman writes a computer program for solving a certain algebraic problem, and it's, it's widely considered the first important computer algebra. She's really combining the symbolic method with physics and geometry, with, with algorithms, She's doing all of that together, and she's doing it all together, not because she thinks, I want to bring stuff together. She's doing it together because it's natural to her. This is the way to solve problems. You use whichever tool will work at that moment for that aspect of that problem. She became a leader in making formalism intuitive and making them both logical. Um, when you read her first proofs, you can't read them. I mean, you can't make any sense of her first proofs. Then in 1915 through 1918, she proves some theorems that we still accept today, and you can understand her proof, sort of. You can certainly understand her theorem. Then in, 19, in the 1920s, she publishes very important proofs in abstract algebra, and those proofs are the proofs that you read in textbooks today. Her proofs are still used in textbooks today. I wanted to... to type a, to LaTeX a copy of one of her first proofs. And I thought, I'm going to try to match her notation as well as I can. This might be hard because a 1920s journal, it wasn't hard at all. It's very easy because the LaTeX fonts are based on Springer Verlag fonts. She published in Springer Verlag journals. We're still using the fonts that she used, and we're still giving the proofs that she gave of those results in the 1920s, not her, not her proofs in the 1910s. But her proofs in the 1920s, we still give those proofs today. Um, because they are the simplest, nicest proofs. They're just really nice. Mathematicians are not afraid to, to simplify a proof or, or, or replace a classical one by a modern one. But those proofs, there's no better replacement. She personally led a successful movement to algebraize all of mathematics. Topologists talking with her made her tools basic for topology. She she create she told them how to create the basic tools of algebraic topology, and they will tell you so in their publications. They'll say we took these these methods from Emmy, Emmy Netter's advice. She told us how to how to do this, and it's still standard to, to basic algebraic topology. Of course, algebraic topology has moved on to much farther, more advanced methods, but the basic results are still proved using the tool. Her students, Van der Verden and Krull, made her tools basic to commutative algebra and algebraic geometry. She was the one who first said, 
algebraic geometry needs to be based on commutative algebra. And when you read a book like Hartshorn today, when you read a Tia, uh, when you read any, any of the Grotendieck oriented algebraic geometers, they will say, oh, it begins with commutative algebra. That's Emmy Netter who said it needs to begin with commutative algebra. Ideas she taught to Saunders McLean led directly to his collaboration with Eilenberg, where they created a group cohomology and category theory. Eilenberg says he wrote to he wrote he went to study in Germany. He he went to study logic, but he goes to Göttingen and nobody's doing logic in Göttingen, so he doesn't know what to do. He takes he takes an algebra course with Emmy Natter, and he he writes to his mother, Fräulein Natter's courses are wonderful. She's, she thinks fast and talks faster. It's nearly impossible to follow what she's writing on the board, but one of the chief pleasures of mathematics is learning to think fast. And you have to do that in her course. She, he's, and uh, he tells us, I took her course on what are called cross product modules and I did not understand it. There's two ways to not understand a piece of math. The simple way is you just don't understand it. You, forget it, you don't know what it's about. But the finer way is you look at it and you say, why did she do it this way? Why did she do this over here? And you actually have serious questions. And Saunders meant the second. He, he looked at it and he said, I, I think there's got to be an even deeper level here. He says, I didn't understand it. See, if I had taken that course, I would have just not understood it. But Saunders goes off with that category theory for trying to understand it. In collaboration with Helmut Hasse and Ruth Brauer, she provides the basic tools for cohomological number theory. Cohomological number theory, very standard framework for advanced number theory, class field theory. Um, it's hard, in my opinion, <laughs> um, but she creates those basic tools with Hasse and Brauer. Many of the theorems are named for Hasse and Brauer, but she was working with them on how to do those. In 1916, when she's first breaking away from Cordon's symbolic method, she gives a very nice proof of a, of a different kind of invariant theorem in group theory. She says, what follows is an entirely elementary finiteness proof for the invariance of finite group actions, not invariance of a polynomial, finite invariance of finite group actions, which turned out to be a more important problem. To this day, invariance of polynomials are not that important, but invariants of finite group actions are extremely important, which actually gives complete systems. She is not doing abstract stuff where you don't actually get them. She's giving a proof where you do actually get them. And again, as I say, anything like this becomes infeasible for large enough inputs, but this is actually feasible for rather large inputs. It's not just feasible up to degree six. It's it's, it's actually feasible for fairly large numbers. While the usual proof using the Hilbert theorem on module bases is only an existence proof, she announces in 1916, I'm gonna prove this theorem and I'm gonna do it better than Hilbert did. I mean, she's not even a professor yet. She's barely got her PhD. And she's saying to the world, I'm gonna do this a bit better than Hilbert did. <laughs> she, it's a bit bold. But it's also correct, and and she is at this point friends with Hilbert and Klein, so she's allowed to talk this way. But he, she's telling you, I'm going to combine this. I'm going to take. I'm going to get advantages from Gordon's symbolic method. In particular, it'll actually give complete systems. But I'm going to use abstract methods to do that. The proof is far clearer than her dissertation was put on. Not entirely clear. It's not entirely clear yet in 1916 how that proof works. Uh, the, the, the interpretation closest to her own words seems like it's Gordon's symbolic method. These are meaningless symbols, and she's just got a way of manipulating them so that the answer comes out right. You, know, you get a right answer by manipulating the symbol. That's, that's the closest to her own words in the but the, if you try to read it as if you were Dedekind, because you know she's been studying Dedekind, that makes it look like it's uh, it, it's Dedekind-style Galois theory. 
and the way it's made rigorous today uses Netter's later ideas from the 1930s. Um, so it's, it's a little bit unclear, but it, it has interesting relations to what she did before and to what she did later. Her most famous work is the conservation theorem in, in mathematical physics. Uh, this was an assignment. She's in, she's in the town of Erlangen where she grew up, a sleepy little town, pretty little town, not a lot of excitement there, considered very old fashioned by the rest of Germany. And then World War I starts. This was the widest war there had been yet to that time. It went, it went all through Europe. And so the men are drafted and she gets called to get again, Hilbert and Klein say, Emmy, we need you to come help work, help us work on some stuff because the guys we were working with, they're in the army now. So you got to come help us work on this. And they say, why don't you work on this problem? So the problem was assigned to her by Klein. Now that was a normal way for, for professors to treat a new doctorate. They would say, okay, you're smart, do this one, do this thing. And then you, you would go and do that thing. It still happens to some extent today, but it was normal at the time. But it wasn't her problem. It was she was assigned that problem. It is her most famous. Um, Albert Einstein found a problem about conservation of energy in general relativity. At this time, Einstein and Hilbert and everyone who was well trained in physics believed that physics rests on conservation of energy. It's really all about conservation of energy. And there are mathematical reasons why they, why they thought that way. And you probably believe in conservation of energy to this day. We Actually, everybody still believes in conservation of energy, but there's a problem in geo. Hilbert got in the debate with them. Never proved an elegant, very general theorem showing they were both right. Um, well, I will say something about the general relativity. Einstein shows that the amount of energy flowing into a point equals the amount flowing out. I say, great, conservation of energy. The amount in is the amount out. But in general relativity, the number of points of space is not conserved. Space can expand and contract. So if you have a finite volume, it is not true that the amount of energy flowing in equals the net change of the amount in there. Because how much space is in there can change you get the, what you call infinitesimal conservation of energy. You take a single point, the amount in equals the amount out. But a finite volume, the amount in does not have to equal the sum of the amount out and the change in the volume. It just doesn't. Um, and this remains a problem in GR to this day. It's approximately true for normal conditions in GR but it's not even strictly true for any conditions in GR. And this is a, this is a problem to this day. And Hilbert complained to Einstein. He said, your conservation theorem about points, that's not a real conservation theorem. A real conservation theorem should be about finite volumes. And Einstein says, absolutely, you're right. I wish I had a conservation theorem for finite volumes, but I don't think you're gonna get one. I don't think we can do that. And Netter proves that Hilbert is right, this is unsatisfactory, and Einstein is right, it's the best you can do in GR. She shows that conservation theorems of a classical kind cannot hold in GR. And this remains a research problem in GR to this day. How do you replace the classical conservation theorems? Because you can't get the classical ones, that's, that's just a fact. But you get something like them, so how do we explain how we, physics doesn't break down even though the classical framework of conservation of energy is unavailable. That's still a, a recent problem. I'm imagining here, let's not do GR. This is a bowl. This is a bowl on a flat surface and there's a marble rolling in the bowl. Do you see, do you see that, that, that M thing? That's a marble rolling in this bowl. My mother had a silver fruit bowl and I would roll marbles in. So I'm thinking my mother's silver fruit bowl, but I can't draw it here. <laughs> So I'm going to picture you. This is a bowl with a marble room. Now there's a symmetry of that bowl. If you rotate the bowl, uh, you know, 60 degrees, nothing changes. The marble doesn't move differently. If you rotate the marble 120 degrees, it's just the whole path rotates 120 degrees. 
never proves, well, actually, this is already classically known. The fact that you can rotate the bowl any number of degrees without changing the physics means that angular momentum is conserved. There's a conservation law, angular, conservation of angular momentum, saying that rotating the bowl doesn't change the motion. If you imagine a billiard ball moving back and forth along a line, translating, shifting the line over one foot doesn't, if it doesn't have bumpers on it, shifting it over a foot doesn't change anything, right? If it has bumpers in it, it has bumpers on it. But it's, it's an infinite line. Bowl, bowling balls are colliding on this infinite line. Maybe there's lots of bowl, bowling balls. They're colliding with each other all over. If you shift the whole line over, it doesn't change anything. That's the same as saying, Momentum is conserved. Linear momentum is conserved. That's what's classically known. Netter shows that for systems defined in a finite number of parameters, every symmetry corresponds to a conservation law, and every conservation law comes from a symmetry. The, cl the classical cases of this were already known, but she shows that all of them come about that way. And that 20 years later, when quantum mechanics is being invented, that became a very important principle for finding new laws of quantum mechanics. In classical mechanics, most of the classical cases were already known, not all of them were, but in quantum mechanics, that became a really important principle for finding new conservation laws and new symmetries, both. If you've got a familiar symmetry, there's a conservation law. If you've got a conservation law, there's a symmetry. But for systems defined by an infinite number of parameters like general relativity, there are no genuine conservation laws. I mean, after shows, if you have a Lagrangian system, if you have a Lagrangian mechanical system with an infinite number of parameters, there are no genuine conservation laws. You can get things like the energy into a point equals energy out of a point, but you cannot get that the energy into a finite volume minus the energy out equals the change of the energy. And you can't get that if this net or shows you can't, you, you can't get the kind of law David Hobart wanted. Einstein was right. I too would like that law, but I don't think you can get it. He reads Netter, he says, oh, who knew? I mean, in a very, she shows this in a very abstract setting. It's not about GR anymore. It's about any Lagrangian system with an infinite number of parameters. And Einstein writes to, he writes to Hilbert, he's a little bit angry, he says, Hilbert, what? Why have you not got, gotten her a better job? <laughs> this mathematician needs a better job. And Hilbert writes back in effect, you know, help me with this. I've been trying. <laughs> the, the mathematicians always wanted a better job for her. But in those days, the whole university faculty voted on every appointment. And the humanities professors, a woman? How can you have a woman teaching that? Honestly, honestly. Edmund Husserl explains why you can't have women teaching. So Einstein, he's a little angry at Hilbert, and Hilbert's like, well, I, don't blame me, I've been trying. <laughs> so Netter does all of this. She does much more than, 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 than philosophers tend to remember she did. Um, I, I, it's an interesting speculation. Um, maybe Netter was better at doing this general kind of conservation law because she did not think visually. She wasn't limited to the classical physical context because she didn't have a classical physical imagination. She just had a mathematical imagination. She saw that mathematically, that every conservation law corresponds to a symmetry and vice versa, which is mathematically true. Maybe I think she did not think visually at all. Some people think very visually. Grotendieck did not. I mean, Nether did not. This, that's just um, Yeah, she says she uses formal calculus of variations. And you can write, read any number of histories now say, Emmy Nether used the formal calculus of variations. They write that as if people knew what that was. Nobody knew what that was. She made that word up. That did not exist before Emmy Netter wrote this paper. Nobody to this day knows what she meant by it. So you can say she used it because she says she used it, but we don't know what it means. Um, see here, we're, 
it's sort of like canceling fractions, right? You you know how the chain rule in calculus looks like canceling fractions, and you know it's not canceling numerator and denominator of fraction. But she writes as if it is. She writes as if it is. I, I don't know what she means by formal calculus of variation, but her theorem is correct, absolutely correct. Her proof is very hard to read today. I will, I can't read it. I, I know people who say they can read it. I'm still waiting to talk to them. I'll read it. Oh. Yeah. Nutter's theorems on rings are not constructive, but they have lots of constructive applications. Again, any theorem about a general ring, if you don't say how the ring was specified, it can't be a constructive theorem. Because if you haven't told me how you specified the ring, I can't tell you how to construct anything from it. But very often you take Netter's abstract theorem and you do tell me how you constructed the ring, then I get a constructive proof of some property of that ring. And uh, Greta Hermann used Netter's theorems for algorithms that are still being used today on computers. And the computer scientists, they love to, tr there's at least two English translations of Greta Hermann's dissertation. Because they say, this is great stuff. It made our field. We're gonna, we're gonna translate her dissertation. Yes, and because Hermann, almost certainly on Netter's advice, knew that when you're doing computer algorithms, it's not enough to say this process will someday finish with the answer. That's meaningless unless you can give an estimate on how long it will take to get the answer. Because otherwise you don't know if you can run this thing or not. And Hermann's paper, she not only gives an algorithm, but for each one she proves a bound on how long it will take for a given problem. If the data are this complicated, it will finish in at most this many steps. She makes that standard and it's standard today because it's just not computer science if you can't estimate the feasibility of it. And this, combining all these ideas, starts leading to more articulate foundations for mathematics. It has to, because people are there. If you're really going to use Planck-Array's geometric insight together with these precise definitions, you need to know precisely what you mean by a precise definition. There, so people start formulating foundations to clarify all of this. And so we get several senses of foundations, working foundations, one idea of foundations, working foundations. These are the tools and theorems that practitioners in a field all use all the time. So since the early 19th century, line integrals and the Cauchy integral theorem have been the working foundation for complex analysis. Basically every serious theorem in complex analysis is finally proved by reducing it to the Cauchy integral theorem on certain line integrals. You find the suitable line integrals where the integral theorem will give you that result. Well, uh, it, it, so that's the working foundation for complex analysis. You start with the Cauchy integral. Conceptual foundations orient some work, even if they're not widely known and maybe not even fully developed. Riemann and Lee both made symmetry the conceptual foundation for much of their work, adapting ideas from Galois. This is a fascinating historical subject to read what they actually said about each other, because they did actually talk about each other. Um, neither Riemann nor Lee formalized the analogy, and the results are often used by people who don't even know it, but that analogy drove their work. So that's a conceptual foundation for their work, even though they can't make it precise and people today don't, don't know it. The logical foundations for a part of mathematics as a whole are axioms from which a theorem is followed. That's another thing. Most mathematicians are not very interested in logical foundations for their work, although they're becoming much more interested with the progress in machine proof. Because in machine proof, now you are doing fully formal reasoning, and so you want to know what it, what it rests on. Logical foundations replaced Klein's logicians. What Klein called logicians, the mathematicians who give precise proofs, 
that's basically everybody today. It's, of course, different mathematicians are different amounts of careful, but it's the norm. It's absolutely the norm. Mathematics should be logically rigorous. It's a question of how much to go in, in detail to go into, but compared to the 19th century, it's all, everybody today is at least as careful as Weierstrass was in the 19th century. Um, so instead of what Klein called logicians, we use that, that logic for logical foundations, which are not always very directly tied to practice, although with machine proof, that's changing. Brouwer reversed formalism, intuitionism. Brouwer was a very strange person, crazy in love with his philosophy, <laughs> according to Hans Freudenthal. Hans Freudenthal was a normal, nice person. But Brouwer was a genius and not exactly a nice person. By age 30, Lautzen Echbertus Jan Brauer. That's hard enough to say in English. It's impossible to say if he used them. It's just not Mandarin sounds. They're not English sounds either. <laughs> he had radically raised the level of rigor in topology. He was a genius. He was known to be a genius. He grows up, he goes through high school. Everybody says, Lautzen, you're a genius. You've got to become a mathematician. You got to make the Netherlands famous for mathematics. Netherlands is a very small country. They've had a couple of famous mathematicians, but they'd like to have them. Um, they say, you could do that. You could go become a famous mathematician. So he says to himself, I can't compete in the old fields of mathematics. I'm not going to go into differential equations because the Germans have been doing that for 200 years, and I'm not going to even be able to learn what they did. But I'll go into this new field of topology because that's pretty new, and there aren't good proofs in it yet. And he does. He goes and he proves a series of crushingly important theorems in topology that everyone interested in topology had been trying to prove, and no one could do it. He gives these amazing proofs. Um, Freudenthal says, when I, when I went to university and learned about topology, they told me that Brouwer had proved these theorems. So I, I looked at his, at his proofs, and I thought, I really want to learn these. Then I tried to read them. That was a bitter labor. He gives he writes these amazing proofs that you look at them, they look right, they, they're short, they look clear, they look persuasive, until you try to tell what they actually say, at which point they become very, very different. Um, but he had radically raised the level of topology. He had solved Hilbert's fifth problem on Lie groups. He had corrected plausible and widespread failures of imagination on topology of plane. People had accepted lots of plausible arguments about topology of the plane that were just wrong, and Brouwer noticed they were all wrong, showed they were wrong. He proved truly great theorems in topology. He was a founding contributor of the leading Dutch philosophy journal. He was very interested in philosophy. He was a famous logician in Klein's sense. Brouwer was a logician in Klein's sense. He gave really rigorous definitions and proofs. He had an international reputation for it. He was an intuitionist in Klein's sense. He, he geometrized those problems, he, including analytic problems in Sophus Lee's group theory. He was not a Kleinian formalist. He did not give calculations in his early work. In his early work, no, he's, it's all conceptual, brilliantly conceptual, absolutely clear. He made his reputation by avoiding explicit construction. Within a few years, he would reject logic and neatly reverse the meanings of intuitions to formalist. He would shift away from geometric intuition. Brouwer, the intuitionist, in his mature work as an intuitionist, he says, there is no geometric intuition. Geometry is a branch of physics. You see non-Euclidean geometry. You know that's not intuitive. There is no geometric intuition. There's only the intuition of time, or as he said, the basic intuition of one to -ity. And you might be thinking, maybe my English isn't good enough. What is one to it? No, it's not your English. It's the phrase. It's, it's a made up phrase. Nobody knows what it means except for our. Um, yeah, what the, the basic intuition of one to a T. That's two, the number two. Um, he still calls himself an intuitionist. He likes calling himself an intuitionist. He believes honest mathematics should be intuitive. But now there's no geometric intuition. There's only intuition of, of finite numbers. 
he would become what Klein called a formalist. He starts saying, I need explicit calculations. I don't believe these conceptual things because there is no geometric intuition. You need to give me explicit calculations. He still, he uses formalists as an insult, so he calls Hilbert a formalist. By a formalist, he means someone who uses classical logic. Formalist used to be someone who gave algorithms, which Brouwer is now doing. No, he doesn't like that. And now I mean, for Brouwer, it means someone who uses classical logic. Um, Brouwer liked arguing with people. He, he did. One Sunday morning, Brouwer, he was living out in an artist colony, a small, a small village in, in Holland for, for wealthy people, for authors and painters and all. He goes to visit his friend. His friend isn't at home. What would you do if you went to your friend's house on Sunday and your friend wasn't at home? You would break the windows, right? That's what Brouwer does. Brouwer gets angry and breaks the windows. He's, he, he, he's a crazy person. He just really is. Um, and, and you can read his philosophy if you want to, but you have to know what he later called intuitionism is the opposite of what Klein called intuitionism. What he later calls formalism is the opposite of what Klein called formalism. Um, he's a vivid thinker. He, he, he actually, early on, he gave a, a lecture series on philosophy. Uh, he was, people say, oh, it's so bold, it's so original, I never saw anything like it. That's because they don't read popular philosophy from 1900. And what Brouwer says in his, philosophy, in his philosophical lecture series is what any university student who had heard of Nietzsche but hadn't really read Nietzsche and wanted to rebel against their parents' religion, they would say what Brouwer said. It was just, just student philosophy, ordinary student. I'm not, I'm not against ordinary student philosophy. But don't don't kid yourself about Brown. It's not original. It's just it's just coffee house philosophy. His dissertation got him off to a very fast start. He became a professor by I think age twenty five, which in the Netherlands was unheard of. In the Netherlands at that time, normally you would not become a professor until you were sixty years old and about to retire. That was when you began. Brower becomes one of 25. And now he says, oh, I've been promising this new math. I got I to come up with a new math, you know, some new way of doing math. I said I was going to, now I got to do it. And he comes up with his intuitionism, which if you like it, you like it. But I understand it is not what he meant by intuitive himself in 1908 or 1910. And it's certainly not what Klein meant by intuitive. It's an interesting topic, but it's, it's often not what it, a good open question. How geometrical was the work before 1912? You could study it from that point of view. Um, already by 1970, favorite temporal intuition. Oh, yeah. Brower met Hilbert before they became enemies. They did become enemies. Hilbert very unfairly had Brower removed from the editorial board of a prestigious journal just because Hilbert didn't like him. It was kind of unfair. But they became enemies. But they met on a beach in 1909. Brower is a young man. He meets this senior figure, David Hilbert. This summer, the world's foremost mathematician was in, and I love saying this in Dutch, saving. Again, it's not English, it's not Mandarin, it's Dutch. Um, I was in contact with him through my work. They had been writing. Now I have walked around with him and spoken as a young apostle with a prophet. He was 46, but young in soul. He swam powerfully and cheerfully climbed over walls and barbed wire fences. The beach in Skavenea is surrounded by very high sand dunes, and you're not allowed to walk on them because it'll fall, they'll fall down. But that doesn't apply if you're a professor. If you're a professor, you should just climb over the barrier and walk on those dunes. Um, so, they, so they did that. Um, Brower, he liked he liked arguing. Hilbert liked arguing. Brower never meant to insult Hilbert or offend Hilbert. Brower adored Hilbert, 
but he was just such a combative Brower was such a combative person. They just ended up, they became bitter enemies. And this is all too typical of formalism, intuitionism, and logicism as philosophies. They do become enemies of each other by the 20th century, but they're not what Klein was talking about. They're not what came out of the mathematics. They're what came out of arguments about foundations. It's genuine intellectual history but it's not mathematics anymore. It's just philosophical. So that's what I'm just. Well, so.